Today, we are going to look at a crime that was committed at the very end of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to England. Louise Josephine Massé was born on the 15th of June, 1863, at 109 Guildford Street, Russell Square in London. Her father was French and was called Etienne Massé, and her mother was English and named Elizabeth Raphael. Louise lived in a nice house with her parents and two sisters and enjoyed a comfortable upbringing as the middle child of her parents' three daughters. She was an attractive, cultured young lady who spoke both French and English. And although she was educated in London, she also spent time in France. In 1895, she fell pregnant. And in May 1896, she gave birth to an illegitimate son called Manfred. In the late 19th century, there was much social stigma associated with unmarried women having children out of wedlock. So in August the same year, Louise went to live at 29 Bethan Road, Stoke Newington, where she resided with her sister named Leone and her sister's husband named Richard Caddish. They did not charge her any rent, so she had no financial responsibilities other than her baby. But Louise decided that she wanted to work. So after seeing an advertisement in a newspaper, she placed Manfred in the care of Mrs. Helen Gentle, who lived at 210 Clyde Road in Tottenham. It was agreed that the fee for looking after the baby would be 37 shillings a month, which Louise always claimed was paid by Manfred's father. Louise visited her son every Wednesday and would usually take him to the park at Tottenham Green, where at first she would push him in the pram, and as he grew older, she would watch him walk and play with the other young children. Her good education and the fact that she spoke French and English enabled her to find work as a day governess for a wealthy family. Louise was also a very accomplished piano player, so she would earn extra money giving piano lessons in the evening. In September 1898, a young Frenchman named Edor Lucas moved next door to Louise. He was 19 years old and had come to England to work as a bank clerk. Although Edor was only 19 and Louise was now 35 years old, the two of them started to have a relationship and Louise seemed to grow very fond of the young, handsome Frenchman. In May 1899, Edor and two friends accompanied Louise to Brighton for the weekend, where they all stayed at Finley's guest house. Louise really enjoyed herself, and she agreed with Edor that they should go again, but this time just for two of them. As the couple got closer, Louise told Edor about her son, and he ensured her that it made no difference to their relationship. For the next few months, the couple continued to see each other. On the 16th of October 1899, Miss Gentle, the lady who had been looking after Manfred for the previous three years, received a letter from Louise, informing her that Manfred's father had requested that the boy go back to France to live with him and be educated there. Louise wrote that she wanted what was best for her son, so had agreed that it would be good for Manfred. Eight days later, on October the 24th, Louise met Edor at Liverpool Street Station and told him that she would be travelling to Brighton the following Friday. Edor said that he would meet her there. He would not be able to travel until Saturday the 28th of October. They agreed to make two reservations at Finley's Hotel under assumed names and tell the hotel that they were brother and sister. The following day, Wednesday, October the 25th, Louise visited Miss Gentle to make her arrangements to collect her son. Miss Gentle had looked after Manfred since he was only a few months old, and as she lived with her ageing mother, the arrangement meant that she could earn a living while also helping her mother. Manfred was also an energetic, cheerful little boy, and Miss Gentle had very much liked him living in the house. Louise again explained that Manfred was going to France and the two of them agreed to meet outside the Birdcage Public House at Stamford Hill at 12.45pm on Friday, October the 27th, so Louise could collect her son. When the day came, Miss Gentle made her way to the meeting point and handed the little boy back to her mother, who after thanking her for all her kindness for the previous three years, 
boarded a horse-drawn omnibus bound for London Bridge Railway Station, where she had told Miss Gentle that she would catch the train to New Haven and then the ferry on to France. But she had also agreed to meet with her door in Brighton, and she could not have done both. Louise and Manfred arrived at London Bridge Station at about 1.40pm and made their way to the waiting room. Louise exchanged pleasant conversation with one of the female attendants named Georgina Worley and Louise told her that she was waiting to meet someone at the station. 45 minutes later, another attendant named Ellen Rees started her shift at the station and at about 2.40 she saw Louise with Manfred. He had become distressed and started to cry. When Ellen asked Louise why the child was crying, she replied that he was missing his nurse. Ellen then asked how old the child was, and Louise replied that he was just over three years old. Louise then decided that she needed to cheer up her son, so took Manfred for a walk to buy him a cake and made her way out of the waiting room and towards the cake shop. It was now 3 p.m. Just over three hours later, at 6.19pm, two ladies were at the train station at Dawson Junction in North London. Dawson Junction is just over four miles from London Bridge, where Louise and Manfred had been waiting for their train. The ladies were called Mary Tian and Margaret Biggs. They were in Dawson to attend a lecture, but just before they left the station, Miss Tian went to the ladies' restroom. The restrooms were quite dark and had two cubicles but Miss Tian was unable to open the door of the first one. She peered down to see what was preventing her from opening the door and thought she could make out a child's face. In total shock, she hurried back to the waiting room and accompanied by her friend Miss Briggs, went onto the platform and asked the porters for assistance. Two porters went to look at what was blocking the cubicle door. It was dark and they only had lamps to see what they were doing but they were horrified to discover a small child covered by a black coloured shawl lying on the floor and next to him there was a broken brick. The porters immediately contacted the police. The police came and inspected the scene. They called the doctor who arrived and made a full examination of the body. It was now 6.55pm and the doctor informed the police inspector that in his opinion the child had died at least two hours before. The deceased was taken for a post-mortem and after examining the body in more detail, the pathologist confirmed that the time of death was between 2.55 p.m. and 5.55 p.m. Though he believed it was more likely to have been somewhere between 3.55 p.m. and 4.55 p.m. And the cause of death was suffocation. The police, however, had to identify the child as there were no reports of any missing children and no form of identification on the body. The police took their usual course of action when trying to identify an unknown person and published a description of a deceased in the newspaper. On Monday the 30th of October, Miss Helen Gentle, who had been the lady who had been taking care of Manfred for the previous three years, came to the police station and told the police that from a description of the child she had read about him in the newspaper, she feared but it sounded very much like the little boy that she had had in her care and who had recently been returned to his mother. The police accompanied Miss Gentle to the mortuary where she tearfully identified the body to be that of Manfred. Miss Gentle then gave the police the address of Manfred's mother, Louise. The police quickly went to the Stoke Newington address where Louise lived with her sister and brother-in-law. When they arrived, Louise was out teaching a piano class so they interviewed her sister. Leone told them that she and Louise had discussed the fact that Manfred's father wanted to educate him in France and everyone agreed that it would be best for the child. She confirmed that her sister had left the house at about 12.30pm on Friday the 27th to meet Miss Gentle and then travel to New Haven, board a ship and cross the channel. The police asked Leone what time her sister had returned and after a slight pause, she told the inspector that Louise had arrived home at 9pm on Sunday, October the 29th. The inspector then asked if she had noticed any difference in her sister's character since returning from her trip, but Leone said she had not noticed any change. The inspector then left the house, 
but left two non-uniformed officers nearby to monitor if Louise came home. They did not see her, but they did note that another gentleman arrived and then left with Louise's brother-in-law, Richard Kaddish. So they decided to follow them. The two men travelled to a house in Streatham Road, Croydon. The police officers waited outside for a while, but then decided to see what was going on inside and knocked on the door. Once inside, they discovered that the house belonged to a man named George Sims, who was the husband of Louise's other sister. They also discovered a very upset and distressed Louise Josephine Massey. George Sims informed the police that Louise had arrived there a few hours earlier in a very confused and anxious state. He said that she had been reading the newspaper when she came across the article that her son had been found dead at Dawson Junction Station. She had come straight to their house and was extremely upset. The next day, the police interviewed Louise. She told them how Manfred was looked after very well by Miss Gentle and how on Wednesday she would go and see her son and take him out to the park at Tottenham Green. She told them how she loved Wednesdays and often spoke to other mothers while her son played with other children. On one particular Wednesday, October the 4th, 1899, she had gone to the park with Manfred and she started a pleasant conversation with two ladies who were sitting close by. A little girl named Millie was running around in front of them and one of the ladies told Louise that she was Millie's mother. They told Louise that they owned a small private school in Chelsea and that as Manfred was growing up, he would need a good education and said that they would very much like to have a smart, polite little boy like her son at their school. Louise was curious as she knew the value of a good education. It was nearly the turn of a century and she was anxious to try and give her son the best opportunities available. She had always felt bad that her son was an illegitimate child and she had not given him a very good start in life, but considered this something too good to turn down. The elder of the two ladies said her name was Mrs Browning and informed Louise that the fee would be £12 per year for his board, plus 10 shillings a month for man for his education. Louise thanked them and they arranged to meet again the following Wednesday at the park. Louise liked Mrs Browning, so they all agreed that Manfred would attend the school and they decided to meet again on Friday, October the 27th, where they would go together to Chelsea to visit the school and Louise would pay the two ladies the money for her son's board and education. Louise, however, was aware how happy Manfred was at Miss Gentle's house and knew that she had become very fond of her son. She really did not want to tell Miss Gentle that she was taking him away as she thought that he would get a better education elsewhere, so invented the story of his father wanting his son to go to school in France. To make her story more plausible, she thought she would spend the weekend on the coast in Brighton, as she had enjoyed herself so much when she was there the previous May. On the day that she had arranged to meet the two ladies, they arrived nearly two hours late. This meant that Louise did not have enough time to go with them and visit the school in Chelsea and get back in time to catch the 407 train to Brighton. So she handed them her son and the bundle of clothes that Miss Gentle had given her, along with the payment. She asked for a receipt and Mrs Browning went off to find a pen and paper. But as she took so much time to return, Louise could not wait any longer. And after saying goodbye to Manfred, went to the platform to board her train. The police were very intrigued with her story, but they considered it just that, a story, and arrested Louise and charged her with murder. The case against her, however, was not overwhelming, so they set out to gain more evidence. The police soon ascertained that Louise had arrived at London Bridge Station, and this was confirmed by two waiting room attendants, Georgina Worley and Ellen Rees, who had both spoken to Louise at the time and day in question. Georgina added that Louise had told her that she was waiting for someone. However, Ellen told the police that she had seen Louise again in the ladies' toilets at 6.50pm, but this time she was alone. She added that Louise had inquired at what time the next train was to Brighton. Ellen also said that she saw her again 20 minutes later on the platform. The police then organised an identity parade 
for her to identify the woman she had seen that day at London Bridge Station. Without hesitation, she identified Louise. The police visited Finley's hotel in Brighton, where Louise stayed for the weekend. Louise claimed that she had arrived there in the early evening, but the hotel owner, John Finley, and a chambermaid named Alice Real told police that Louise had checked in around 9.45 under the name of Miss Brooks. On Saturday, October the 28th, a brown paper parcel had been found in the ladies' waiting room at Brighton Station. The parcel was taken to the lost property office, but was not claimed. The parcel contained a child's jacket and some clothes. When the police showed the items to Miss Gentle, she confirmed that they belonged to Manfred, and he had been wearing them when she handed him over to his mother. The police traced the black shawl that was discovered with the body to a draper's shop in Stoke Newington, very close to where Louise lived. The sales assistant confirmed that she had sold it to a woman, fitting Louise's description. The police also asked her to attend an identity parade. She picked out Louise, but said she could not be absolutely certain that she was the same woman. The police now thought that they had enough evidence, and the case was sent to trial. The trial of Louise Massey started on December the 13th, 1899, at the Old Bailey, in London. The prosecution told the court that they considered the motive for the crime but Louise was very much in love with Edor Lucas and considered her son could become a barrier to their relationship but in court this was denied by both Louise and Edor. The prosecution also claimed that Louise may have wanted to save on the fees she had to pay Miss Gentle but again this was denied. Louise denied purchasing the black shawl in Stoke Newington that was found with the body when Louise gave evidence, the prosecution told her that it was strange that she would hand her child over to two ladies she'd only met on two previous occasions, and should have at least visited the school, which if she had done, she would have discovered did not exist, and the Brownings did not live at the address they gave her. She told the court that she had travelled on the 407 train to Brighton, and arrived there at just before 7pm. She went to a restaurant, she had something to eat before looking at the shops. Louise's evidence contradicted the evidence from the attendant, Ellen Rees, who testified that she had seen her at the platform at London Bridge shortly after 7 p.m. The autopsy gave the probable time of death of 4.30 p.m., which the prosecution outlined to the court would have given Louise enough time to have left London Bridge Station, travelled to Dawson Junction, and then returned to London Bridge where the attendant allegedly saw her again at 6.50 p.m. The defence informed the court that Louise's picture had been in all of the papers and it's highly probable that Ellen Reese would have saw these pictures before she attended the identity parade and it was quite probable that the person the witness thought she saw may not have been Louise but someone else entirely. The trial was getting national press coverage and as it was going on Another witness came forward, who was the waiter at the restaurant in Brighton, where Louise said she had eaten. He told Louise's lawyers that Friday, October the 27th, had been a very damp and dull day, so they had only seen two customers. One was a lady wearing a black dress. This lady had entered the restaurant at about 7pm and stayed for about 45 minutes. Both the waiter and the owner of the restaurant said that they were sure they could positively identify Louise as a lady. For some reason, however, the defence chose not to look further into the statements or use them as witnesses. Another witness who had seen two women with a child sometime after 3.50 on the 27th of October near to London Bridge Station was not called to testify by the defence. Neither was Mr John Hughes Ellis, who was on board a bus which stopped at London Bridge Station where two women and a child got on the bus and sat opposite him. He felt that the child did not want to be with them. However, his time frame did not fit with Louise's testimony, as he gave the time of around 3.30pm, but said he was not entirely sure, and it could have been later. The trial ended on the 18th of December, and the jury was sent out to deliberate the case. They returned to find the defendant, Louise Josephine Massey, guilty, and the judge sentenced her to death. She was taken from the court to Newgate Prison 
and placed in a condemned cell to await her punishment. After the sentence was passed, the defence decided to look further into the potential evidence from the waiter and the owner of the restaurant in Brighton. They asked Louise what she had eaten there and she gave two conflicting answers, neither of which agreed with the restaurant's sales register, so the witnesses' statements were discarded. Louise Josephine Massé was hanged at Newgate Prison on January the 9th, 1900. She was the first woman to be hanged in Britain in the 20th century. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next Brief Case 